Thank you very much all for coming uh, to the Fletcher and Gimo conference on U.S.-Russia relations. Um, in some ways, this has been an interesting experience organizing this because we have had to deal with the actual geopolitical realities of the state of the Russian-American relationship, which is to say we had a conference planned in terms of participants back in June, and then due to uh, some minor irritants in the bilateral relationship, we had some difficulties getting visas for some of the participants uh, from IMGIMO, uh, which provides a wonderful moment for me to thank, in particular, Andrei Baikov, uh, the vice rector of IMGIMO, uh, for helping me to organize this conference, uh, as well as being able to adapt to the fact that there were certain people that we could not invite uh, and finding uh, other people to replace them. I would certainly also like to thank uh, everyone at the Fletcher School, uh, particularly Molly Douglas and Arik Burakovsky for handling all of the fabulous logistics involved. Uh, and I would also like to thank the Carnegie Corporation for providing generous funding uh, for this uh, conference. I should say that this is the first of two conferences that we plan on holding, the one right now, and then in May we will hold a parallel one with IMGIMO uh, in Moscow. And uh, Professor Baikov and I, in terms of organizing this, decided that this is the conference where we will, as we would put it, air our differences. Um, in other words, before we can talk about possible prospects of future bilateral cooperation or cooperation among the great powers, it's worth saying where we're going to potentially disagree, where we're going to agree to disagree, and where potentially there might actually be shifts in positions. And so as a result, the issues that we're going to be tackling this, uh, today are primarily the contentious ones. Um, but as one of the, uh, the MGIMO uh, faculty that's here, uh, Dmitry Streltsov, said last night, um, one of the things that we have the opportunity of doing as opposed to actual uh, officials from both Russia and the United States is we get to be irresponsible academics, meaning we occasionally get to speak our mind. Uh, of course, this being a, a conference, there's, of course, last-minute changes, which means um, for the first panel after the welcoming session, uh, the part of Roland Paris will be played by myself um, and uh, played poorly, I might add. But that said, we will start by uh, welcoming the uh, two people to open up the conference. Uh, first, uh, my dean, uh, James Devridis, uh, former Supreme Commander of NATO and now dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Uh, and then after him, uh, the first deputy permanent representative of Russia to the United Nations, uh, Pyotr Ilyichev, uh, will both welcome uh, the conference and then we will go right into our first panel. So if you can, join me in welcoming Admiral Stavridis. Good. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Fletcher School, and welcome to Tufts University. Um, first of all, how strange is it that we're at a conference where Dan Dresner is wearing a necktie and yeah. Dean Stavridis is not? You won't often see that. Um, my own uh, engagement with Russia, I think, uh, began in high school. This will not be a long talk, by the way. Um, <laughs> My original engagement uh, began in high school as I began to read Russian literature. And I suspect many here, given the proclivities of this conference, would join me in recognizing that uh, Russian civilization is well plumbed, well understood, and richly illuminated by Russian literature. So. Whatever our differences, I will always be grateful to Russia for Pushkin and Tolstoy and Gogol and Dostoevsky above all. But um, I wrote some years ago a short piece about how Russian literature explains Russian foreign policy. Um, it was slightly tongue-in-cheek, but it was reflective of a deep, long affection uh, for Russia and Russian literature. Having said that, I spent uh, the majority of my professional life in the military in what was called the Cold War. And if you want to understand what my life looked like, go watch the movie The Hunt for Red October, uh, which has some fairly amusing fictional digressions. But I think in the end is an interesting portrait of the Cold War. And these days people often say to me, gosh, we're in a new Cold War. Nope, we're not. I'm old enough to remember the actual Cold War. The Cold War was two massive armies aligned across the Fulda Gap in Central Europe, prepared to go to combat immediately. The Cold War was two enormous battle fleets 
playing the hunt for Red October from the Arctic ice to the South Atlantic to the Western Pacific in dangerous, provocative conditions constantly. The Cold War was two enormous nuclear arsenals, many times what are on alert today, on an absolute hair-trigger status. <clears throat> the Cold War was two implacable foes facing each other geopolitically with very little, very little positive engagement. We are not in the Cold War. However, we do have profound differences, significant differences today with the Russian Federation. I am very pleased to see that we'll begin by looking at the historical roots of this. How did we get here? History is not predetermined. We could be in a vastly different space. By understanding the path that brought us here, we will better illuminate these differences and ultimately in May explore what we can share together. But we must begin with those differences. They include cyber activities going both ways, but most publicly, cyber events associated with the Russian involvement here during our electoral period. We need to explore that. Syria, where we see profound differences in support for Bashar al-Assad, who by most accounts would be considered a significant war criminal. And I think above all, events in Ukraine, where we see an annexation of Crimea and a continuing engagement in southeastern Ukraine. These are blunt things to have to say, but a conference with academic freedom has to explore them. There are countervailing views, which I know we will hear from our Russian colleagues and friends today. That is why we gather. But I'll close by saying that I think our interests converge more than they diverge. And as we look ahead to May, if you will, the good stuff, I think we can find a great deal upon which we can cooperate collaborate. I would put counterterrorism in this, counter narcotics, counter piracy, the Arctic, the high north, arms control, missile defense. I think there is trade space in the U.S. missile defense system in Europe. Our interests, in my view, in freedom of the seas coincide. I think there is a great deal we can cooperate upon. We will confront each other at times, but the future must be one of collaboration, of partnership. We cannot get to that just as we cannot get to May in this conference without facing the very real differences that divide us today. So I'll close on an optimistic and hopeful note which is that if we can find these zones of cooperation with the Russian Federation, the potential for unlocking deeply significant and profound international problems is almost limitless. Let us focus on that bright light. Let us illuminate where there are differences, air them out, but above all, let us go forward in a spirit of friendship, cooperation, collaboration as exists today between the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and the world-renowned Mgino. Spasibo. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Ambassador Nibens requested me to pass his regrets that he's not able to, to join you today, but hectic dynamics at the Security Council kept him uh, busy at New York. You know that today there will be some very important activities in the Council, so he should be there. Uh, he also asked me to, to pass his personal regrets that he was delighted. He, he planned it uh, beforehand, but life is life. 
Well, I'm proud to be at the Fletcher School, uh, and I'm proud to be among academia, especially about some teachers, professors from Gimo that I graduated 29 years ago. Uh, along with, with this pride, I am experiencing some kind of envy of jealousy because during my studying, it was impossible that students from Soviet Union could come to, to the United States and to engage in any kind of, of conference. But worse, I envy those who are gathered here because you are meeting at this specific conjuncture. As Admiral Stavridis said that relations between our two countries are at the lowest level since the Cold War. We can diverge uh, we, uh, in the process of rebirth of Cold War, but the relations are the coldest, uh, I meaning the coldest that uh, we could have. But uh, what the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, keeps on saying, Member States at the United Nations sometimes behave not only because of their core national interests are affected or um, are at peril, but sometimes they act because of fear, because of mistrust between themselves. And I think that today's conference will be one of the opportunity, if not to dissipate all these fears, but to give an, an impetus to this track to diplomacy to, to find a common vision for our two countries to cooperate. We are going to, uh, to discuss it uh, later, where we disagree, where uh, there are areas where can we possibly agree. But as the Admiral Stavridis referred to Russian literature, so I think that we have to concentrate on two major questions. Who is to blame and what to do? I wish every success to your conference. Thank you. 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 Mr. Deputy Ambassador, thank you for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you again. Uh, it's a very difficult topic to, to start with because uh, you have to speak about everything. So uh, there's a possibility that I'm going to hijack some of the topics that are going to be discussed in detail later. But uh, I'll try to avoid it as much as possible. Uh, the world that we are living now is unstable, fragile, unpredictable world. And we know the starting point of our journey. It's the end of the Cold War, it's the end of uh, bipolar world. Uh, we know our desired destination, a more democratic, a more fair and just world, but we are not sure how can we get there or can we get there at all. Unfortunately, this instability is aggravated by unpredictable character of foreign policy that is now being followed by new administration. Um, James Tavre Redis mentioned that there were some disagreements, there, there were some agreements. If we look in hindsight for some two or three years, well, the situation was not optimistic, but still uh, we could have been proud of, of some of the achievements. I would uh, mention some of them. Well, 2013, Russia and the United States agree on chemical demilitarization of Syria. How it was implemented later, uh, it's another question. Uh, we had Paris Pact on climate change, but now again the administration is withdrawing from the pact. We had a major breakthrough in 2015 in uh, Iranian nuclear deal, joint comprehensive plan of action, but again, it's now in danger. Um, one of the brightest spots that I, I could mention is our joint efforts to curb Ebola epidemics in Western Africa. When Russia, the United States, France, some other countries joined efforts and uh, we managed to curb it and we managed to eliminate it at least for, for the time being. So, 
we always had our disagreements. We are having the, uh, these disagreements, and we are going to, to have this disagreement, but it doesn't prevent us from uh, finding responses to major issues, and the, the issue number one, both for Russia and for the United States and for, for the whole world, is the international terrorism. We are very glad that uh, President Trump, when he came to, uh, to the White House, made a focus on combating international terrorism, and it translated in policy shifts uh, all over the world. Um, we still disagree on some major issues, and it was mentioned Syria, Ukraine, Europe as a whole. Uh, if we look at Syria, uh, we are there, and the United States are, are there, firstly, to, to combat international terrorism, to combat ISIL and Nostra Front, uh, some other terrorist groups. We are getting some successes, but without solving uh, root causes, core issues, without the political process in Syria, we cannot provide for the stability of this country or for the region. Uh, on Ukraine, uh, there is different interpretations of, of, of what happened. Uh, there are questions about priorities, uh, what matters more, uh, territorial integrity or the right of the people for self-determination. What happened in Crimea is in full compliance with the Charter of the United Nations, uh, Article 1, that provides for people's self-determination. It's fully in line with Helsinki Final Act. Uh, people of Crimea had the opportunity to express themselves freely and openly, and uh, you know the participation of almost 85% and the results almost 93% that opted for independence are there. Um, some people argue that uh, a pretext of unconstitutional change of government in Kiev was used in, in Crimea, but I would remind you that in 1991, when the declaration of independence of Ukraine was adopted, one of the main reasons for this was the, if I'm not mistaken, I'm quoting, mortal threat of uh, failed coup in, in the Soviet Union for Ukrainian independence. So we will differ, but uh, those differences uh, should not be preventing us uh, from cooperating. And despite all differences about, despite all harsh rhetoric, we see some seeds of uh, nascent uh, cooperation. Again, it's Syria. We started with deconflicting between uh, Russian armed forces and uh, the American forces that are there on the ground. And uh, for more than one year that uh, we, we are there, uh, two years that, that, that we are there, there was not a single conflict between uh, um, our two forces. But also, uh, despite all legal frameworks that we have in the United States that legislation prohibits uh, the United States uh, to cooperate with uh, Russia militarily, um, we established first joint uh, de-escalation zone <coughs> in southwest of Syria that, among with three other zones, translated in a huge reduction of uh, violence, of uh, uh, some semblance of uh, restoration of uh, order or restoration of economic uh, life. Well, last week's uh, joint statement by two presidents in, uh, in Vietnam is also showed that when there is a will, we can cooperate. So, uh, on Ukraine, uh, there were already three meetings between uh, uh, Special Representative Sorkov and uh, Special Representative uh, Walker. Um, we may 
differ on uh, the results or, or conclusiveness, but still the talks are going on. And the fact that the Russian proposal for uh, UN peacekeeping mission to protect uh, special monitoring mission of, of OSC was not rejected outwards, like our Ukrainian colleagues did, is a good sign. Um, you saw remarks after this Monday's meeting in Belgrade that the American side proposed 29 uh, proposals, options, three of, of which are suitable for Russia. It's not a big proportion, but still it's a start, starting point of cooperation. So again, despite all our disagreement, despite uh, all our heated rhetoric, domestic issues in, in this country, in my country, <coughs> especially the, before the election next March. Well, we are doomed to cooperate, and it's, it's good that President Trump himself is saying that you cannot solve any major issue without cooperation between our two countries, and let's see how we, we're doing in practice. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Ambassador. Our next panelist is Dr. Dan Dresner. Dr. Dresner is a professor of international politics at the Fletcher School. He is also a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institute. Dr. Dresner. Uh, thank you very much. Um, as you might have noticed, uh, Roland Paris's name is on the program. Uh, unfortunately, he was not here due to some uh, travel difficulties. So in terms of my qualifications to be on this panel, um, well, there's a couple. One, I'm not Roland Paris. Uh, number two, I am not an international lawyer. Uh, but three, I am a public intellectual, and I wrote a book about public intellectuals that just came out six months ago. So for all of you curious about what that means, what it means is, is that you have to pinch hit at the last moment to try to sound cogent about a topic that you don't have a ton of training for. Uh, so that's what I'm going to try to do uh, in with what is without question less than five minutes of, of remarks. Um, rather than talk about the precise uh, particularities of international law, which I'm going to leave to, uh, to Jack Goldsmith. I sort of want to talk about the overarching conditions of basically where we got, how we got to here, um, which is you can argue that during the, the sort of post-Cold War period in particular, when the US was in a genuinely, you might say, hegemonic position, you could argue that was the peak of the notion that uh, the United States have of using the United Nations, particularly concepts like R2P, the responsibility to protect, as a way of advancing both US interests and humanitarian interests um, across the globe. And so you saw a high-level panel being constituted in the mid-2000s to try to, try to create um, a doctrine that would sort of ex post justify what NATO did in Kosovo in 1999, uh, to some extent partially justify what happened in Iraq in 2003, but also presumably justify humanitarian and peacekeeping missions going forward uh, as, a way of, uh, as a way of adding legitimacy to, uh, to interventions in war-torn or uh, places of disputed sovereignty. Now, the effect of that, uh, I think we are now feeling, which is to say there was significant blowback uh, as a result of, of US efforts, and the belief in particular after the Libya intervention, um, which was authorized by the UN Security Council, uh, that the United States had abused these kinds of uh, approaches to international law. And so to some extent, you can argue the blowback came in the form of Russia and China repeatedly vetoing uh, UN Security Council movements to take action in Syria. And even domestically, you can argue it led to blowback in the form of the election of Donald Trump uh, in 2016. And indeed, in the first year of the Trump administration, you have seen a particular attitude by this administration towards adherence to international law and international regimes, which is to say that one of the things that has happened is that, and we, we saw this also with respect to, to Trump's recent trip in the Pacific, but also his previous overseas trips, which is it seems very clear that the President of the United States views foreign policy as in primarily personalistic terms, which is to say, in his mind, if he gets along well with a foreign leader, that is a demonstration of progress in foreign policy, and it doesn't necessarily need to be institutionalized in any way. Um, you know, you can have announcements of deals and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, in his mind, it's whether or not he is getting along uh, with other leaders, which leads as a result, and he was consistent about this during the campaign, to some skepticism uh, 
about the role that international law might play and the role the United States might play um, in terms of upholding international law. And we've seen this already in the form of the U.S. announcement of exiting from UNESCO, uh, the U.S. exit from the Paris Climate Change Accords, um, and most recently, the United States announcement that it would no longer adhere to the extractive, uh, the EITI, uh, the Extractive uh, Industries uh, Transparency Initiative. Um, now, obviously, to some extent, this is causing, this might be an instance in which Russia potentially, this is a situation where the Trump administration might be closer in attitude on some issues to Russia than perhaps its allies in the West. If, if Roland Paris was here, I guarantee you he would be arguing uh, rather vociferously the advantages to the United States potentially of adhering uh, to some of these international agreements. But I would argue that essentially what the Trump administration is doing is putting an end to what you can argue the U.S. position for a long time has been about sovereignty, which is what my, uh, my old advisor, Steve Krasner, referred to as organized hypocrisy, um, which is to say that basically there was a recognition that, international so that, that state sovereignty was an important concept, that it had to be respected, but in some ways the exceptions overwhelmed the rule. Um, and so as a result, the way that, that Professor Krasner talked about it was the notion that there was simultaneously this recognition that there should be a norm of sovereignty but there could also be a recognition that that norm was going to be frequently violated uh, when a great power had to pursue its interests. And in some ways you can argue that what the Trump administration is trying to do is eliminate that artifice and trying to eliminate the hypocrisy and simply saying, we will you know, uh, potentially uh, vacate or, or uh, withdraw from agreements that we feel are not in our interests uh, because we believe uh, that state sovereignty uh, matters far more. And so if the United States is gonna do that, it will potentially decide to use the United Nations as a way to put pressure on other countries um, if there are particular problems, but um, obviously it, it creates problems in terms of consistency, in terms of trying to apply it. And I think the way the Trump administration is handling this is to basically say, we don't care if there's necessarily a neutral uh, doctrine about this. We are gonna advance our interests, uh, whether that requires using the United Nations or not using the United Nations. Um, the interesting question is whether or not this would be a permanent shift, I think, in the U.S. position about international law um, or a temporary shift. And here I don't know, and this is, uh, I will defer to experts on this, but I would argue that when, when you think about American politics, for most of the post-Cold War period, there's been a long-standing tradition of the executive branch basically being more enthusiastic about the United Nations than the legislative branch, which is to say that the United States, you know, even under the Bush administration, there, while there wasn't overwhelming enthusiasm for the United Nations, there was a recognition of the utility of the United Nations um, as an important tool. And at the same time, the executive branch has always had to deal with Congress in terms of getting to fund the United Nations and ideally getting them to reform, uh, Congress always pushing for uh, reforms of the United Nations. One of the interesting questions going forward, and I don't have a prediction on this, but it's worth noting, is that if the executive branch switches this much in terms of its approaches to the United Nations, whether you will see blowback from Congress as a way of embracing the United Nations, uh, as a way of both demonstrating some resistance to uh, the Trump administration's foreign policy and you know, to its greatest extent, a way of trying to potentially check some uh, abilities of the Trump administration to pursue aspects of foreign policy that Congress might find uh, somewhat untoward. With that, thank you very much, and I would like to defer to a much greater expert than me. Thank you, Dr. Dresner. Our final panelist joining us today is Professor Jax Goldsmith. Professor Goldsmith is the Henry L. Shattuck Professor at the law at uh, Harvard University. Professor Goldsmith is the author of Power and Constraint, The Accountable Presidency After 9-11. Prior to joining the Harvard faculty, uh, Professor Goldsmith was the Assistant Attorney General, or served in the Assistant Attorney, Attorney General Office of Legal Counsel. Professor Goldsmith. Thank you, and thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, so the core norm of sovereignty in international law is in Article 2.4 of the UN Charter, which prohibits the use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of another nation. It prohibits one nation from violating, from using force to violate the territorial integrity or political independence of another nation. And my own view, and I think this is borne out by the history of going back to 1945, is that both Russia and the United States view this principle entirely opportunistically. Um, it's it basically organized hypocrisy that Stephen Krasner talked about, that Dan talked about. 
Um, now, the Bush, the, and I'm going to explain what I mean about that in a second, the Trump administration, as Dan said, has really altered the U.S. stance towards global governance on across the board, really, an extraordinary array of issues, both in terms of substance and what they're doing and their attitude towards international institutions. But I would say that the one area where that's not true, the one area where the Trump administration has followed in the footsteps of the Obama administration and the Bush administration before it is on these use of force issues, and I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Um, the, the extent to which the invasions of Ukraine and Crimea, perhaps actions in Georgia by the Russians violate the charter, I think they're well known. There are arguments on both sides, but the basic argument is that the Russians have been intervening uh, and violating the territorial integrity or political independence of those states. And the the counter-argument is that there's either a self-defense argument or there's a self-determination argument. I'm not going to talk about the Russian side. I'm going to talk about the U.S. side. And I'm going to talk about three ways in which the United States, and this has been especially true in Syria, but not only in Syria, three ways in which the United States has interpreted the charter opportunistically over the last 15 years, continuing in the Trump administration to water down the prohibition, um, well, I was going to say water down the prohibition on the use of force. It's, I'm not sure if it's watered down or if it's excuses for, for, for uh, ignoring, because watered down suggests that the principle has a lot of bite in the first place. Um, two of the three ways in which they've done this have to do with self-defense. As you know, Article 51 of the UN Charter creates an exception to the prohibition on the use of force for certain forms of self-defense. Uh, it actually says self-defense in the face of an armed attack, which is a very narrow exception. But that exception has, since 1945, been interpreted to include actions in anticipatory self-defense in some respects. The United States, the first thing that the United States has done, this was very controversial under the Bush administration. They stretched, and this was one of the justifications for using force in Iraq, although it ultimately was not the one that was relied on, but it was proffered by the Bush administration, and it was very controversial at the time. The idea that certain states or terrorists in states present threats that are so extreme and that are so hard to find that the eminence requirement that we usually have for an exercise of anticipatory self-defense needs to be stretched and expanded. That was an extraordinarily controversial idea under Bush. What's been less controversial, for reasons I, we can talk about perhaps, is that President Obama eventually came around to the same view of self-defense for basically the same reasons. And the United States, especially under the Obama administration, has been successful in getting the British and other countries to, to embrace this more flexible conception of self-defense. And this is one of the justifications for the United States that it's been using uh, force, for which, under which it's been using force in Syria, particularly against the al-Qaeda elements. So that's one way in which the United States has weakened the territorial integrity norm. Another one, another self-defense idea, is this idea that one nation is allowed to use force in self-defense against another nation, against terrorist threats in another nation, if that nation is unwilling or unable to stop the terrorist threat. And we have used this justification as well for the use of force in Syria and elsewhere. This was a more controversial uh, proposition uh, as, as, as a way of getting around the 2-4 prohibition that you could use you could use force if the nation, if the other nation was unwilling or unable to check the terrorist threat. Uh, it, was, it was fairly controversial at the beginning of the Obama administration. By the end, the Obama administration, which was very successful in international diplomacy, especially legal diplomacy, they were able to get a lot of people on board for that proposition. And that's the second element in which the U.S. has uh, watered down the 2-4 norm, or at least defied it, or at least uh, thinned it out, let's say. The third way is uh, with so-called humanitarian intervention. I won't say so-called, I'll just call it humanitarian intervention. Um, the Trump use of force in Syria in April, I think it was, of 2017 in response to the use of chemical weapons by Assad against his own citizens was, in my judgment, a very clear violation of the UN Charter. Um, and it doesn't even because the Charter does not create an exception for humanitarian intervention. As bad and as awful as those norms were, excuse me, as those, viola those were violations of international law in Syria, no doubt about it. No doubt about that. But it was also a violation of international law and a violation of sovereignty, and international law is in tension on this point. 
for the United States to intervene and use force there. It wasn't, this is important, it wasn't an example of the responsibility to protect as that idea is, is technically understood. The responsibility to protect that was agreed to by the nations of the world in 2005 is expressly dependent on, in other words, using force in exercise of the responsibility to protect is expressly dependent on um, prior of consistency with the UN Charter, prior authorization by the Security Council, for example. So that was a third example where the United States, and that was a big step. Now, the truth is the Trump administration was, we don't know for sure, but probably almost certainly relying on exactly the same legal arguments that the Obama administration had reached in August 2013 when the President Obama was threatening to use force in a very similar situation and then backed down. Um, but so this, again, it has, it has its roots in an Obama administration rationale and principle. That's the third way in which the United States has I would say tempered or watered down the norms of Article 2.4. I'm not making a judgment call yet. We can talk about this, about how the human rights, humanitarian concerns should be traded off against sovereignty concerns. That's a tough question. I just want to say in terms of the sovereignty idea, the United States was leading the charge there in defying it and watering it down. Um, so I just want to say two more things and then I'll stop. One is that... Um, you know, we're talking about how close we are to going back to the Cold War. There have been two confrontations in Syria. It's very dangerous. The use of these arguments, there's more going on in Syria, obviously. But the use of these arguments by the United States has brought it very close, I think as close as we've been perhaps since the end of the Cold War, to actual military confrontation with Russia. And one was the attack on the air base in response to um, in response to the chemical weapons. There were uh, Russian facilities and Russian troops on that air base. There were, I, I think that the story said that there was no, no Russians were targeted, no Russians were killed, but it, it was a high point of tension. And the second one was when the United States shot down a Syrian airplane uh, last summer uh, and caused a very sharp exchange between the United States and Russia, and Russia claiming more aggressive air rights in Syria. Um, this is a situation where the United the Russians, in terms of international law in Syria, have very much the better of the argument. They're in there, just on international law, I'm talking about what international law says. They're in there with the consent of the Syrian government. The United States is not. So this is a f potential serious flashpoint where, if you think it matters, international law favors the Russians. I think I'll just stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, before we begin and shift to the question and answer session, uh, Ambassador Lyshenko uh, was going to submit a video today. That video was not able to be transmitted in time, but he has a prepared statement that is available for those who are interested in reading it, and that can be found at the back of the conference hall. Uh, there are no questions yet posted in pigeonhole that are, that are visible to me. So we'll start with uh, questions from the audience until we get those. And I encourage people to use the application pigeonhole. Uh, and please, just for those who are asking questions, I'd like to remind you to uh, keep your questions to questions, where the uh, statement would end with a question mark and, and not just use that opportunity uh, to present a statement. Uh, please, ma'am. Good. That's a, that's a very tough question. Uh, I don't have a great answer to that question. I think the United States should pursue the foreign policy that it thinks is best. And that's a very tough trade-off when you're intervening in Syria to stop a human to respond to a terrible humanitarian action, but there's the possibility of sparking, a, you know, a, basically a major war in the Middle East. That is a very tough set of trade-offs. I don't think any of us without a lot more information about consequences and what would be targeted and things like that can make that call. 
I guess my view is that the United States should make that call without much regard to what international law says. I think that's in fact what it does. International law on this point is flexible enough to allow it, uh, the United States to essentially intervene or not intervene as it wishes. So my, my answer to your question is, it really depends on the details. I think it's a very tough trade-off. There's danger, terrible danger on both sides, but I don't think international law should play a large factor. Yes, sir. Council, in, in cases where the UN Security Council either has not acted or perhaps refuses to act, because NATO is not technically, not formally a regional arrangement under, under the United Nations Charter. It's more or less on the same plane with all of its members being equal in sovereign states. Uh, that was applied in the case of Kosovo. Uh, conceivably even, uh, perhaps, even though there are UN re resolutions with regard to uh, NATO's role in Afghanistan. Um, with developments occurring in Zimbabwe, uh, the African Union is likely to become more in involved as a kind of buffer, perhaps, conceivably leading to some sort of forcible intervention. And what, uh, to the panel generally, what is your view about the role of regional organizations when it comes to the exertion of influence, possibly even the use of military force? Someone else want to take that? You want me to take a shot? I mean, I'll answer the last one, which is to say that I, I think increasingly you're going to see regional organizations in some ways taking the lead uh, for any kind of intervention uh, in a situation in which you, you have state failure, if for no other reason that a regional organization deciding, yes, there is a sufficient crisis that actually justifies intervention, in some ways sends the most credible signal to the UN Security Council that the United Nations can then potentially, in theory, authorize or at least you know, give it imprimatur uh, to that kind of intervention. Um, the problem, of course, arises in regions where there isn't necessarily, you, know, you have a region that is sufficiently split that you would not necessarily get uh, an organization to buy in on that kind of intervention. I mean, it, part of the issue here is that you, know, you can talk about the African Union, for example, certainly as a regional organization which within Africa would potentially take action, or you could talk about a much smaller grouping like ECOWAS. Um, you know, in, in West Africa. And I think the question, and here I'll, I'll defer to Jack on this, is that I could easily see an instance in which a regional organization might justify intervention, but there might be a challenge at the United Nations level or among great powers asking, is that regional organization sufficiently representative of the region? May I, you want to go? After you. Okay, thank you. So there are a lot of things here. Um, you know, I'll just speak about Western powers. Western powers have many options of organizations through which they can act to legitimize their actions. The first and best option is the UN Security Council. When that doesn't work, we go somewhere else. In the Cuban Missile Crisis, we invoke the Organization of American States as a fig leaf or explanation for why we were doing what we did. In Kosovo, as you say, we, uh, we operated through NATO. Um, on the question of whether regional organizations will and should be acting more and when there's UN failure, I think the answer is yes, they will. We see this happening all the time. It's just the standard move by big powers when they can't get what they want through the charter, through the Security Council, they go to the regional organization. I'll just simply say that it doesn't make the use of force lawful. It doesn't, uh, operating through NATO, as, as happened in 1999 in Kosovo, for actions that otherwise violate the charter doesn't make the action lawful. And even the strongest supporters of the NATO um, 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 intervention in 1999 did not claim it was lawful. The claim was it was um, legitimate but not lawful or something to that effect. So it's better than acting alone, but it doesn't give the legal imprimatur. And politics is, is not entirely separate, but somewhat separate, but it doesn't give the legal imprimatur that Security Council authorization would. Mr. Deputy Ambassador. If I may uh, answer for, for the first question, I'm not going to, to say what the United States should do, but uh, there is an agreed framework, resolution of the Security Council 2254 that provides for political process for, for Syria, for political settlements leading to uh, internationally uh, elections under international uh, 
um, observation with the participation of all Syrians, including the, the diaspora. Um, we should concentrate on it and not support uh, opposing sides. Then the best solution to humanitarian crisis will be a political settlement. It's good that in joint statement by two presidents that was issued uh, November 11 uh, last week, we recognize and we refer to recognition by President Assad that he's there for free and fair elections under international observation and with the participation of all Syrians. And again, um, we see that there is a change in US policy that at least you don't put um, removal of Assad as a precondition for political settlement. Well, although you, you're saying that uh, there is no role for him in the future, but still, uh, until the political process is not over, uh, now nobody disputes uh, the role and uh, place of President Assad. Uh, for, for the second question on regional organizations, I think that the African Union is most powerful and must, most um, critical, so to say, organization. We have a charter on uh, democracy on elections that provides that if there is an unconstitutional change of government uh, in Africa, the country will be uh, expelled from, from the African Union and other measures, including use of force, uh, can be used against the uh, uh, unlawful government. And the good example was January this year when there, was, there were elections in Gambia, but the President Yaya decided to stay. Uh, it was ECOWAS, Economic uh, Community for Western Africa, that uh, showed demonstration of force. We didn't fire a single shot, but uh, elections for uh, complete uh, transition was co completed in peaceful and fruitful manner. Yes, sir, but uh, we're going to have you wait until the microphone has been passed to you. My name is uh, Daniel Satinsky. I'm a graduate of the Fletcher School. Um, it, my question is about looking forward with concepts of sovereignty. It looks clear from but what we know and from you've described is that the great powers have sort of outgrown the compromises that were enshrined in the UN or, or have ignored them in uh, you know, the disruption, particularly of the Middle East and uh, ignoring of um, any notion of sovereignty there. Is there a notion going forward around which you think that the great powers uh, in a multipolar world can agree to that would reduce the risks of uh, future conflicts around intervention in uh, other countries? Thank you. Uh, so I don't think there's a conceptual apparatus that will do that. The concept of sovereignty, as Stephen Krasner showed in his book and as Dan was talking, has always been an opportunistic and changing construct. It's not like it's become problematic in the last 10 or 15 years. It's been problematic throughout the history of international relations. It's had its challenges since the UN Charter. That was an attempt to uh, change a set of sovereignty constructs that prevailed before. My own view is that we shouldn't think about this, about what are the right concepts of sovereignty that we can coalesce around. I think that there needs to be, I think the right way to proceed is to have the lawyers come in last. There needs to be, we need to find political equilibria that work. That's much easier said than done. And then once we find political equilibria that work, we should try to get the lawyers to gussy it up and make it perhaps, you know, uh, you write it down and, and help make it a little bit more self-enforcing and the like. But I don't think that we should be thinking about sort of legal concepts first as a way of organizing these conflicts. Please, Mr. Ambassador. Oh, I fully agree with Jack. Uh, we have the charter that says everything. If we follow the charter both in letter and in spirit, then we can avoid uh, future conflicts. Uh, this concept of uh, responsibility to protect, uh, in 2005 there was an attempt to get a decent, so to say, decent legal framework for humanitarian intervention, but uh, every element that is there in the outcome document should be followed strictly that there are only four crimes now uh, 
the American policy, foreign policy uh, provides for a vague term of mass atrocities, although we have only four crimes mentioned in the outcome, war crimes, genocide, uh, ethnic cleansing, and uh, crimes against uh, humanity. Also, what is there totally corresponds to, to the charter that it's the responsibility of the host government to provide for security of its own people. If it's not in a position, then uh, international community should try to uh, to help to raise capacity of, of the state. If it's incapable or unwilling, unwilling, then we should look for other measures under chapter six, eight, or, or seven um, of the charter. Uh, thanks. Dr. Dresner? In some ways, I just want to ask my fellow panelists an, another question again, because I am not an expert on international law. Let me stress that again. Um, which is to say that, Jack, I understand your, your notion of the idea that first you have the political equilibrium and then the law follows. I guess my question is, are we ever going to be in a political, political equilibrium? I mean, it strikes me that we're going to have this sort of constant lag effect. As much as we talk about the new normal with the Trump administration and the approach to international law, do you think that this is a permanent shift, or are we going to have you know, a, a sort of yin-yang thing where we wind up seeing a shift in the United States back more towards what would be considered more traditional liberal internationalism? Uh, well, that depends on, I mean, it depends on what happens to the Trump administration. Uh, right now, it's not looking so good for it. And um, I think that, I think two things. These are predictions. First of, first of all, on your first point, uh, you know, we have pockets of political equilibria that work for a while, and international law coalesces around that. Look at the European Union, look at NATO. There was even a political equilibrium of sorts during the Cold War. There are times when the Middle East is in better shape and worse shape. Um, on the question of whether, I think that the establishment view, which is not the Trump view, mm. the establishment bipartisan view is that most of the international institutions that the Trump administration is defying or pulling away from uh, serve U.S. interests. And so I think that there's likely to be a um, return to that after the Trump administration to some degree. That said, I think there's a growing, for lack of a better phrase, anti-elitist streak in uh, American and, and um, isolationist streak in um, American views towards foreign policy. So that might be a break on that return. But I don't think that, that Trump represents a permanent shift. The question is, what kind of damage to these institutions and to this view of the world can be done? I mean, the gutting of the State Department and the withdrawal, it's not just the State Department, the withdrawal of the United States from active participation in these institutions allows other actors like China and Russia to come in and really change things such that when you get a globalist presidency back in, the situation on the ground has changed right. and might, we might not get back to where we were before. Thank you. Uh, we do have a uh, couple pigeonhole questions now. The first is, uh, what effect, if any, does the use of U.S. and Western economic sanctions against Russia have on international governance and the global order? <laughs> There's you read a book about like that. To start. I can claim expertise on this. Um, truthfully, I think it has almost no effect um, because uh, the sanctions that were imposed obviously did not were, were not imposed under any sort of auspices of international law. There was no United Nations uh, call for such sanctions, and obviously there never will be, given that uh, Russia could always veto such an implementation. Um, at the same time, the sanctions clearly did have some effect economically on Russia, and you could potentially argue had some political effect as well in terms that it did seem to place some constraints on Russian activity, particularly in southeastern Ukraine. Um, does this lead to sort of changes in, in global governance? If there, was a if there is a change, unfortunately, I think the change is to degrade global governance even further. Um, because in some ways, the United States, in learning that it actually has this, to, you know, 20 years ago, if we were talking about economic sanctions, the consensus in, in the United States would have been, well, they don't work. Why are we even talking about them? They're a strictly symbolic tool. Um, the consensus has clearly shifted in Washington in such a way that I used to be more of an, you know, I, back 20 years ago I was like, well, no, sanctions have their uses as a tool of diplomacy, and now I'm more like, whoa, slow down, we are getting way too enthusiastic about uh, the use of sanctions. But I could easily see a situation in which the Trump administration, and for that matter Congress, this is not uh, unique to the administration, 
is so enthusiastic about the, the, the tool of economic sanctions that they decide they don't necessarily need these other global governance structures, that they can simply act unilaterally or act in concert uh, with key allies to impose costs. And that does not necessarily bode well for global governance. Thank you. Deputy Ambassador? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, those sanctions uh, have effect more economically, or more um, global effect on the redistribution of uh, uh, commerce channels of uh, demand of supply, but also they have a political influence on uh, global governance in the sense that uh, in multipolar world, uh, the European Union is losing more than Russia, it's losing more than the United States, and it's one of the tricks that the United States want to ascertain its uh, supremacy in the, in the world, so trying to indirectly um, lessen uh, the capacity, the potential of uh, not its adversary, but of its partners on the um, economic uh, arena. Thank you. Professor Goldsmith, did you? I think we have time for one more question. Yes, Professor. Wait for the mic. Well, that was fascinating. Thank you all. Um, and who are you again? I'm Salman Khan. <laughs> I teach at the Fletcher School. Uh, question is about the concept of international law and global governance and order. Uh, these concepts, people often argue, were set at a time when the United States was supreme and it set the rules in terms of the power structure it wanted. If a more multipolar world is emerging, this is a let your imaginations loose question, what kind of new norms, especially if the Trump administration does do what people are suggesting and withdraws from global governance altogether, what kind of new norms do you think will appear, whether it's freedom of the seas or intervention or what have you? And do they bode well or ill for us? Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Dresner? <laughs> okay. Um, my answer is going to scare the crap out of you, um, which is to say that I, I, in this sense, I'm a, a firm believer in John Eikenberry's argument that essentially when you, if you can argue there are, I, I like the, the idea of pockets of international law or pockets of stability in terms of international law, they almost always tend to happen after great power wars because that's the moment in which sort of power relations are extremely well defined and presumably the victors of any kind of conflict can then write the rules and if they are wise, write the rules in such a way that the losers feel that they have a stake in the system. So, you know, the Congress of Vienna after the, the end of the Napoleonic Wars, um, which you can argue did establish a set of rules that were reasonably stable for the next century. The Treaty of Versailles, which did not nearly work as well uh, for a whole variety of reasons, and then of course the post-war international order after World War II. Um, the disturbing element about this is that it is harder to point to instances in which you can argue that reservoirs of international law have been created without that kind of significant sort of and, and clarifying moment of great power politics in which power relations are well defined. So I don't know if we have a precedent for this. This doesn't mean that it can't happen, by the way. This might be due to a failure of my own imagination or a failure of John Eikenberry's imagination. But it does mean that we can't, I don't think we can look to the past as a guidance on how to proceed on this level. So I agree with that with regard to big security issues and maybe even with regard to some of the big picture economic issues that you probably had in mind after World War II. Um, and I think we're gonna be moving towards on those issues regional and ad hoc um, um, understandings and coordinations and the like. But since I've been so slashingly pessimistic about international law, let me, <laughs> let me end on a, an upbeat note. Excellent. Global governance, there are thousands and thousands of treaties, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of multilateral, almost universal treaties for every sort of cooperation that are working just fine and are not affected by anything in the Trump administration or the confrontations between Russia. And when you walk into Whole Foods and you can buy grocery products from around the world, getting those products from around the world to Whole Foods depends on a whole set of treaties about aviation and regulatory standards and all sorts of things that are working great and haven't been jeopardized. 
So I think we should put it in perspective, but we're talking mostly here about sovereignty and high-level security issues. On those, I'm pessimistic with Dan, but on a whole, and, and trade, you know, even, even with trade stalled, we still have an enormously successful global cooperation on trade. Uh, and then there's all the other things we never talk about because they're working just fine and there's no disagreement. So global governance is working remarkably well on most issues. It's just on some really, really important ones involving security and, you know, basically security and sovereignty, fundamental issues, we're in a period of particular contestation, I think. Thank you. Mr. Deputy Ambassador, yeah. we'll give you the last word. Yes. I don't think that we have to reinvent the wheel. We, hold, we have the, the whole assets of, of laws, of uh, provisions that should be abided by. It's the implementation that is lacking. Uh, it's selective implementation. Uh, I'm sure you're going to, to talk more in detail about joint comprehensive plan of actions on Iran. Uh, it has two aspects. First, it's non-proliferation aspects that uh, it's a compromise and uh, Iran is complying uh, fully and uh, its activities are verified by International Atomic Energy Agency. But second, it's a uh, it's an example, it's a decisive effect for other countries. Now that the GPRK is looking at Iran and saying to the United States that if you don't honor the, the deals that you concluded, what do you expect from us? And uh, what Jack just said in the beginning that in Syria, Russia and the United States were very close to confrontation. I think that since Cold War, the world is very close to a conflict because of proliferation issues in uh, around the PRK. Thank you very much, and thank you to all our panelists this morning, and thank you for the questions.